My name is Kristen Pritz. I work for the City and County of Broomfield, and I'm their Director of Open Space and Trails. And thank you very much for coming out on this beautiful evening. We have two primary speakers tonight. Uh, Wendy Kiefover Ring will begin, and then Chris Middeldorf will uh, come after her, and then we'll have a brief kind of closing um, summary for you. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about Wendy Kiefover. She's a homegrown Colorado gal. Um, three of Wendy Kiefover's grandparents were born in Colorado, one in a sod house on a homestead near Lamar, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, Wendy grew up in Lakewood, Colorado, and in 1995 she landed in Broomfield here with her three spaniels. Wendy contacted me this fall and volunteered her time and expertise to help with this public meeting and really helped to initiate it. In 1994, Wendy served on the board of Sinapu, the group dedicated to restoring wolves to Colorado, and became a staff member of this organization in 1998. Since that time in 2008, Sinapu is now with the Forest Guardians. They merged to become the Wild Earth Guardians. For a decade and a half, Wendy has been a leader in native carnivore conservation, animals like bears, bobcats, coyotes, and wolves. To name just a few of her comp accomplishments, in 1997, she built the coalition that stopped contest hunting in Colorado. This is the practice of shooting as many coyotes or prairie dogs as possible to gain prizes. Colorado was the first western state to ban this practice. She has worked on mountain lion conservation in Colorado, Montana, and New Mexico. Now these three states have mandatory hunter education programs that protect breeding females and their kittens. Wendy holds a master's in history from the University of Colorado, and her master's th thesis focused on politically active Colorado women during the period of 1893 to 1912, who worked on environmental and health issues. So Wendy, you're kind of following in the steps of many of these women. Please come on up, let's give her a hand, and she'll begin with the first part of the presentation. Kristen and Pete, thank you so much. You did so much work to get this organized and put together tonight. I'm, I'm very grateful. It's, and I hope I don't spill my water. Okay, there we go. Um, I love viewing coyotes in Broomfield's open space, and I have been, I've seen them for years and years. And this summer, I've had two kind of strange encounters with coyotes. One, actually, right here um, at the library, I was like, I don't know, pretty, you know, maybe seven o'clock in the morning. It was very light. And a coyote came right charging up toward me and my two uh, medium-sized dogs. And so I said, stop, and it trotted away. So um, that's what tonight is about. It's about talking about habituated coyotes. And so um, what I'm gonna go over is a little bit of coyote ecology. They are um, Canis latrans. I'm gonna talk about natural history and coexistence. To start with, I'm gonna talk about the ecology of large carnivores and coyotes, and I'm gonna talk a lot about predation. I'm really excited about the, uh, about the topic of predation because it's so important and so undervalued. So um, the star of tonight's show um, is the coyote. It is a, a dog that weighs about 30 pounds on average. And in comparison, a gray fox, another Colorado native, weighs about 10 or 12 pounds. So a coyote is about one third larger than a gray fox, but a wolf, a gray wolf, usually on average weighs about 100 pounds. So it's one third larger than a coyote. So um, there's a term that biologists use to um, talk about carnivores and how and what they eat, and one is an obligate carnivore. Does anyone want to know what? Does anyone know what that means? Nope. Hazard a guess. Come on. Okay. Right. They are obligated to eat meat. That's all they eat. They're these guys are the ones on the Atkins diet. So all these carnivores you see here are obligate carnivores. So um, wolves, mountain lions, bobcats, um, black-footed ferret, and lynx. I took this picture of the lynx. I want you to know. <laughs> That's my one photo. And then we have facultative carnivores. Anyone want to hazard a guess what that means? How about you? Right, they're omnivorous, exactly right. So um, coyotes and bears, both grizzly bears and black bears, are facultative carnivores, meaning that they're omnivorous. And so 
Um, bears, 90% of their diet comes from plant material, whereas coyotes, 90% of their diet is, is meat. So there's this great film that um, ha has come out recently in 2009. It's called Lords of Nature, and we show it periodically, and maybe we should show it here too. Um, but it's about um, mountain lions and wolves and the role that top carnivores have in the ecosystems. And one of my favorite lines from the movie is one of the great paradoxes of our existence, out of death comes life. And this year in July, 21 biologists published a paper called The Trophic Downgrading of Planet Earth. And what, what they found was um, worldwide, large carnivores are disappearing. And with their disappearance, we're losing um, huge amounts of biological diversity. We're losing ecosystem function. It changes fire. It changes disease. It changes invasive species. So it, this is an incredible movie, and it really illustrates how important top carnivores are in ecosystems. I will try and do this in about two minutes, so you won't get the full effect. Um, but this is a coyote um, scavenging on a carcass in Yellowstone. So there's this cool study that got published in Nature um, by Kevin Crooks and the godfather of conservation biology, Michael Soule. And what they found was um, these mesocarnivores, these so-called medium-sized carnivores, house cats, raccoons, and skunks, when they were in, present in uh, ecosystems between urban, ur the urban and rural interface, um, they had a direct negative effect on ground nesting birds. But when coyotes were present in the system, coyotes had a direct negative effect on them. And so they suppressed those populations. But when coyotes weren't present, um, those populations, they erupted and the mesopredator release, and then they, they suppressed the bird population. But when coyotes were there, they, they indirectly protect the ground nesting birds. So do we have ground nesting birds here in Broomfield? Yes, do you want to name some? Burrowing owl, yeah, good. Pardon? Meadowlark, yep. One more that I'm thinking of. Kristen? Kildare, yeah, that's one I was thinking of too. Yeah. So, um, and I'm going to talk about predation, and I'm going to I'm going to um, talk about sort of a ca comparison between cats and dogs. So, how many of you are cat people? Raise your hands. Cat people, raise your hands. Wow, poor showing. Okay, dog people, raise your hands. Yeah, Broomfield is the town of dog people. Okay, so. Um, mountain lions are, um, they have a small head on a robustly muscled body, whereas dogs, unless they're a golden retriever generally, have a large head on a very graceful small body. That's because dogs use their heads to hunt prey, whereas uh, mountain lions use both their, their arms for grappling and their jaws for hunting. So biologists um, term Two, there's two kinds of behaviors in terms of, of capturing prey, and there's the coursing carnivores. So the wolves, for instance, they hunt in packs. They run very long distances to chase down generally the sick and the weak. And then there's the coyotes um, who hunt generally solitarily because mostly what they eat are rodents and rabbits. And so it doesn't work very well to hunt in a pack for a mouse. And then we have the ambush carnivores, so the mountain lions, and the lynx, for example, they, um, they stalk and they ambush their prey and they move very quickly just for short distances. So here's um, some anatomical drawings of a cat versus a dog. And you can see um, the lung capacity of a dog is quite a bit larger than on the cat. So which animal would you take jogging with you? <laughs> the dog, right. Okay, so, and now I want to talk about um, canine teeth. So what do, you, what do you guys think some of the purposes of canine teeth are? To, um, kill to kill their prey, good. Yes, back there. Shred their meat, exactly. And then there's one more. Yes. Yeah, they can grab on. But I'm thinking of one other thing, and maybe the National Geographic photo will prompt. So defend and to wound, um, you know, 
in your same species. So if you're, if you're worried about mates or territory, then you can use your canine teeth to uh, defend or, or wound. So um, to kill, dismember. And then um, I want to show you the difference between a coyote skull and a mountain lion skull of similar size. So this is a coyote skull, and you probably saw some out on the tables out there. And this is a mountain lion skull. So one thing that's very interesting is look at the eye sockets, how much bigger they are on the cat. And the second thing is um, the length of the face. So, uh, you know, a dog has a pretty long muzzle compared to a cat, which has a very short uh, face. And the cat has the, the advantage, if you have two skulls of the same size, a mus that takes far less muscular uh, power to inflict the same bite force because of that shorter size. So if you think about a pair of pliers that are really long or just a short pair, so the short pair is going to have more force. Does that make sense? And then um, cats have um, fur between their toes, which makes them very stealthy as they're walking, and they have retractable claws, which they use to grapple their, their prey or to climb trees. Or when they're accelerating, they'll extend those claws. Aren't they amazing? And then this is my dog, Diggy. He's pretending he's a wolf for us for a moment so that you can see that his claws do not retract. And here is a pack of wolves. This was taken in Isle Royale, and they are hunting a moose. And they will use several quick slashing bites, pretty shallow bites, in order to, um, basically, they're going to hamstring the moose in order to take it down. Um, whereas, compared to a mountain lion, they use a long, strong bite. Uh, their canines are longer, and they're going to use their, their paws for grappling, and they're going to strangle the, the in this instance, this elk got away, but uh, it's, you know, the cat tried its best to strangle this, this giant elk um, using its jaws and its, and its paws. And then we have the coyotes. So similar to the wolves, they're going to use a lot of sharp bites and, and shaking of an animal in order to take it down. So this is a mountain lion on an elk carcass in Yellowstone in the Lamar Valley. And we're going to have some some excitement here in a moment. You're going to see what is trying to usurp the carcass. What is that? It's a wolf. Yeah, check it out. And there's a second one. And what did dogs do when they see cats? <laughs> OK, now, this is going to blow your mind. What is that? And that was a coyote. So check out the size difference between the coyote and the wolf. And the coyote couldn't resist chasing the cat, but it also had to stay away from the wolf. So when wolves were restored in Yellowstone in 1995, um, they took out about 50% of the coyote packs uh, initially. And the other interesting thing about coursing versus ambush, which method do you think is, uses less resources in terms of of which, which way is more efficient? Are you, if, if you're a coursing carnivore or an ambush carnivore? Yeah, exactly right. So you're just, you're sort of waiting for, for the animal to come by and then you, and then you get it. Whereas coursing, you're ha you know, you run and run and you hope you can get it. So biologists found that in Yellowstone, 15 to 25 percent of wolf uh, pursuits um, ended you know, with, with um, being able to take prey, whereas uh, mountain lions, 80% of the time, they were successful. So uh, coursing is less efficient than ambushing. So now I'm going to talk about the natural history of coyotes. And uh, I'm going to start with the family life. Um, so coyotes are probably one of the most adaptable species on the planet in terms of not only their family life, but what they eat and all kinds of other things that I'll get into. So um, they're very good at being loners. So they might be a solitary individual that has a, a territory and they're going to uh, maintain it, or they may be a transient looking for a territory and a mate. Often, and most often, they're a mated pair. So um, coyotes will mate for life. If one were to die, then um, the one that remains will, will find another mate. 
And then thirdly, um, coyotes are very well um, equipped to live in groups called packs. And so um, I believe this photo was taken in Yellowstone. And so generally a pack is the alpha pair, the breeding pair, and then the betas, their offspring. And the, the betas will help tend toward, um, if there's new pups born, they will help tend and raise and guard the den um, with the alpha pair. So um, it, coyotes generally mate in the winter months. Um, there's like a two to four week period when the females um, come into estrus. And actually um, the males only um, have sperm during the same time. So like a two to four week period. So they only breed once a year. And they will have um, between five to eight pups. And the gestation period is usually about 60 days. The pups are born blind. In about 10 days they open up their eyes. And in, um, in about, I don't know, I think eight weeks or so, they're, they're weaned. And after about three or four weeks, um, they'll start to emerge from the den. So um, both the male and the, and the female will provision the pups. And what they'll do is they'll find meat and they'll bring it back to the den. They'll regurgitate it and the pups lick the mouth of the parents in order to, to facilitate that regurgitation. And I've got a movie just of that. But I want you to be thinking about how many puppies you're seeing. So this is the alpha male. This photo was taken, or this video was taken in Yellowstone. See the pup's trying to lick his mouth. He's gonna yak up some food here. Success for that one little guy, <laughs> he ran away so he didn't have to share. So, how many pups did you see, Megan? Five. Five. Anybody else see a different number? But one of them ran away. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, if, if there isn't sufficient food in the territory, the parents will kick the pups out at about um, 10 months, which also co coincides when the female will go back into estrus. And so the, the pups have to disperse at this point. This is when they become loners, and they have to find their own territory and a late, and a mate, potentially, so that they can breed. And uh, when, when a pup grows up and is able to breed, biologists call that recruitment. And when they disperse, sometimes they use acne rockets. No, they don't. <laughs> OK, what do they eat? So there's this great study um, done in the Pinion Canyon Maneuver site. And um, they looked at what coyotes ate. So mostly you can see ratted, rabbits and rodents were the main source of, of food. So only 9% ungulates, so that's deer, pronghorn, or whatever might be down there. Black-tailed jackrabbits, about 20%. Cottontail rabbits about 27%, but you can see rodents by far um, almost 44% voles and mice. And the interesting thing is um, they, they feed on grasshoppers and crickets in August and September, and then in this particular area, juniper berries, October through February. So here's just some fun pictures of a coyote mousing. Pretty energetic. And that's the million dollar shot. Do they have Egyptian eyes? They're so beautiful. So um, coyotes, um, some biologists have been studying them in the Yellowstone area, and they are quite capable of taking down ungulates, even healthy ungulates, such as, as large elk. But typically, they will prey on the neonates in the spring so that they can provision the pups. Um, they'll also scavenge, so if there's um, food left over by wolves or um, bears or mountain lions, they'll go and scavenge on that carcass. And they're very good at exploiting other carnivores. So for example, um, this, the guy, Michael Francis, who took these photos, s said that he often witnessed um, coyotes coming up and stealing fish from river otters, if you can imagine. I would love to see that. And then um, on the bottom right is um, a badger. And so they exploit badgers because badgers can fit down into prairie dog burrows where the coyotes can't. And they may flush out a prairie dog, which the coyote will opportunistically take. Um, Dr. Rich Reading took this photo of a coyote um, near the Denver Zoo, and it was eating a squirrel. 
And then the coyote on the right is eating, you know, has killed a house cat. So a um, couple messages there. Make sure that you keep your cats indoors if you live in coyote country. And I also noticed, I grabbed that photo off the web, uh, off the web but it looks like he has mange because he doesn't have any tail fur. He looks pretty, pretty ratty. Um, so anyway, um, quickly, habitat. Basically, everything is coyote habitat, and I think Chris is going to touch on this more. But before 1850, this brown area, that's where coyotes ranged. After that point, because we had basically killed wolves and jaguars and lots of other large carnivores, coyotes have usurped all this other territory, so all the way down into Central America, east of the Mississippi River, Canada, all the way up into the Arctic. And finally, I'm going to talk about coexistence. So, um, and what I want to point out here is killing coyotes does not reduce the coyote population. That's what the, this is a, a very classic um, synthesis study that everyone cites. Um, so unexploited pack, that means packs where you're not killing coyotes, you end up having older animals, you have greater adult survival, only the alpha pair breed, you have lower reproduction. But when you have exploited packs, and this happens in America, the, the rate of exploitation is just jaw-dropping. It's something like a coyote a minute, someone figured out at one point. You have younger animals, you have lower adult survival rates, and you have more yearlings uh, reproducing. So um, what biologists have found that if you leave the alpha pair intact, um, they, they act as a birth control mechanism for all the other females in, 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 the, in the pack. But once the alpha pair are removed, then all the other females are no longer behaviorally suppressed, and so they can start breeding. So, um, so you not only have more yearlings, yearlings reproducing, but you have greater, coyote, you know, greater litter size. So the upshot is killing coyotes does not reduce the coyote population. And so the, the, why is that important for us here in Broomfield? Because if we kill coyotes and more coyotes come in and we keep feeding them and we have to keep killing coyotes, it's just a terrible thing and that's not acceptable. And so what are some of the things that we can do to take responsibility for ourselves to make sure that we're not feeding coyotes? So um, coyotes will absolutely eat anything. They are adaptable, as I said. So um, they might eat food sources you put out for wild animals, such as birds. They might eat whatever eats, you know, they might eat the whatever, you know, bird, uh, not the birds, but rabbits or whatever. And um, dog food, um, apple orchards, and you know, if you leave trash around. And studies show that coyotes prefer Pepsi over Coke. So I just wanted to show you this. We're, we're gonna do it like 15 times, but how to be smart. So stop, make yourself look big, announce your presence, retreat slowly, tell an adult. And I really wanted to show you this because I just wanted to know whether you thought my hair was better there or here. No, just kidding. Um, and so just some gratuitous, beautiful coyote pictures. Isn't that lovely? That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Wendy, very much. Uh, now Chris Middledorf from the Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, will speak next. Um, he is our local Broomfield District Wildlife Manager, and he also works uh, in the Boulder County area, too. Chris grew up in Boulder County, and after graduating high school, joined the United States Marine Corps. Following his service in the Marine Corps, Chris attended Colorado State University and earned a bachelor's degree in wildlife biology. During his time at CSU, he worked for the United States Forest Service in Boulder County as a biological technician surveying for sensitive wildlife species. He worked on a mountain plover research project with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and also worked for CSU as a technician on a research project investigating the use and implementation of wildlife mitigation structures along Colorado's highways. After graduating from CSU, Chris was hired on with Colorado Parks and Wildlife as a district wildlife manager, and spent three years in Castle Rock, Douglas County, and recently moved back to the Broomfield and Boulder County area this past spring and has been working with us ever since, almost on a weekly basis, wouldn't you say, Chris? 
Um, and Chris helps us with all sorts of things. He helps us with our fishing derby that we put on with the Broomfield Open Space Foundation, uh, general um, wildlife questions, and certainly events like this. So thank you very much for all your time, Chris. I want to thank Wendy again. Her presentation was great, talking about coyote behavior, ecology, biology, and really hitting on the note of coexistence. And that's what we're going to get into. Again, I'm the local wildlife officer. I cover southern Boulder County and Broomfield County from I-25 west to the Continental Divide, north to Highway 7, and south down to the Jefferson and Adams County lines. My presentation is going to cover the historical context of coyote distribution, where they were at and where they're at now, hitting on some of the same points that Wendy talked about. I'm also going to talk about human values that we associate with wildlife, historically and currently, and then talk about management practices, what we have done in North America to manage coyotes in the past and what we're doing now. And that will lead me to my last point about what does Colorado Parks and Wildlife do to manage coyote populations in the Front Range communities. So first off, we have the maps again, very similar to what Wendy showed. On the left, you see pre-European distribution of coyotes. Pretty well contained in the central United States, down through Mexico and the southwest U.S. And then we have current distribution, and we see that those animals have dispersed quite well all the way to the Arctic Circle and south all the way down into Central America. And we can ask ourselves, why did this happen? Was it the removal of the predators that were controlling coyote populations? Was it decisions on management that we made or that folks made in North America through the last 150 years? Was it the fact that coyotes were so adaptable to humans? Well, it could be a combination of factors, but what we need to know now is that coyotes are here and all the efforts of eradication and removal have not worked, and that we need to find a way of coexisting with them. So I want to talk about values associated with coyotes. In history, in the 19th century and 20th century, utilitarian and dominionistic values really perpetuated. And the idea of this was the protection of property and life. Folks were moving west from the East Coast and starting to populate the central United States and western United States and they want to protect their livelihood. And there was some fear of coyotes and other predators. There's also the idea of controlling the land. If you're fearful of something or you want to control, you know, one of the ways of dealing with that is to try to control it. And as we move forward into the 20th century, we get into some different values, naturalistic and humanistic. A naturalistic value is one where people have very close association with nature and they get great satisfaction of being in the outdoors. A humanistic value is one where people get, have a deep emotional attachment to wildlife. An example of this is just like Wendy said with, with uh, a coyote pack, you have a mother and father, and you have children, and you have siblings, just like a human family unit. So there's a lot of similarities there. We have to ask ourselves, are these negative or positive? Well, that's not what we're here for. What we need to know is that there are a lot of different values in current society and from the past, and it just gives a better idea of how humans feel about coyotes. And there's also the scientific value. The knowledge about wildlife gained from research. Understanding the role that coyotes play in a healthy ecosystem. And again, when we develop management practices, we need to look at scientific research and develop ideas and tools and ways to, to manage appropriately. So let's talk about historical management. The 19th century and 20th century was dominated by the idea of eradication, complete removal of coyotes. And it's a combination of social, political, economic, and even biological reasons. There's fear of wildlife, the idea of protecting livestock, and also wildlife protection. And this might seem kind of like a weird thing. Why would you protect wildlife by trying to remove wildlife? And that brings me to my next point. I'm going to go over a couple of uh, lessons learned in the past. Back in the early 20th century, a gentleman by the name of Otto Leopold, who's considered today to be the father of wildlife management, other land managers and livestock producers were on a plateau in Arizona called the Kaibab Plateau. And they noticed a deer population that they wanted to see more animals. They wanted to see more deer. So they got together and they talked about what can we do to have more deer. And the idea was to remove livestock so that the coyotes, or I'm sorry, so the deer wouldn't have as much to compete with for food. And they also decided to eradicate and remove all the predators including lions, mountain lions, wolves, bears, bobcats, and over 7,000 coyotes. And immediately thereafter, they had dramatic results. They had the intended consequence of removing all of that. The deer population went up. But then quickly thereafter, they noticed that the deer were starting to outcompete the resources of the land. 
They are running out of food. They are actually causing the land to be less healthy than it was before. And then there was a dramatic die-off as deer started to starve. And what this tells us is that predators have a very integral part in an ecosystem. So that's our first lesson there. I'll go over this one real quick because Wendy already hit it very well. Dr. Kevin Crooks about mesopredator release. This study relates a little bit better to Broomfield than one that's on the Kaibab Plateau from the early 20th century. And again, the idea here being that if coyotes are absent from an ecosystem, not necessarily through an eradication approach, but through development, and when you have subdivisions surrounded by corridors of open space, somewhat similar to Broomfield, and you have coyotes out of that system, smaller carnivores like raccoons in San Diego, for instance, in this study, opossums, as well as domestic cats flourished and they had very negative impacts on other bird species. So again, just trying to highlight the role that coyotes play a very integral role in our ecosystems. So let's move forward to Colorado Parks and Wildlife Management. Looking at what we've talked about for the last 10 minutes about where coyotes were, where they're at now, the things that we have tried in the past and the things we need to try now. And what we think is probably one of the most effective methods is coexistence. And the idea there is that humans and coyotes living in the same area together. Not necessarily in our houses together, but on the same landscape, in the open space with our neighborhoods next to it. And to get to coexistence, we have to use certain tools to get there. One of them is education. It's having presentations like this, informing the public about coyotes. That also includes the media that we put out um, to the public and other information packets that you'll find just like in the back hallway. We also talk about hazing. I'll get in a little more in depth with this, and then Kristen's going to do some demonstrations. But a very important tool to instill fear in coyotes so they don't feel comfortable around human beings. And then there's the importance of urban coyote research. We can look to other places for research. We can look to Chicago and Los Angeles where they've done coyote studies. But we want to look close to home. What are the interactions that coyotes have with humans here in Broomfield? And when we have better understanding of what they do, we can make the best management decisions. And then there's land use practices. Uh, an example of this is that whenever Broomfield's going to develop, whenever new homes are going to be put in place, we work together on finding ways of having a compromise between putting homes in and also having open space. And a lot of times, we make pretty darn good coyote habitat. And also for landscaping, too. We all have very nice landscape yards and in our neighborhoods, and that might provide habitat for other species as well. And then there's also the human health and safety aspect, which I'll get into here in a moment. As far as education, the next three slides are just some of the education materials. On the left, we have your pets and coyotes. It's a fact sheet. It just tells you how to protect your, pilots, coyote, protect your pets in and around your home and in the open space. The one on the right is a six-panel brochure. It's got biological facts about coyotes, and it also talks about, again, what kind of things can you do to minimize and reduce the, the possibility of having a conflict with a coyote. This here is a, uh, a sign. You'll see this out in the hallway as well. Kristen and Pete have done a tremendous job in Broomfield putting these up on almost every open space. They've been very proactive on getting these signs up before there's ever an issue. And again, the idea of this is not necessarily to, to warn or scare people. It's a precautionary statement that coyotes might be in this area and to quickly read over those bullet points and how you can best protect yourself, your pets, and how to minimize the conflict with that animal. This here is actually a postcard. Um, Recently in the anthem community, we had a couple of coyotes that bit children. And it's very difficult to knock on every single person's door. There's time constraints, there's, there's labor and work uh, constraints. And so what we did working with Broomfield was actually mail this to every resident in the Anthem Highlands, over 500 homes. And it's good to have this piece of information that you could put on your refrigerator or in your house, share with your children, and what kind of things you can do around your home and in the open space to minimize problems with coyotes. So Wendy hit habitat already. I just want to go over it again. There are four components of habitat, food, water, shelter, and space. If you have any one of these components, you have the possibility of having wildlife. And so if we remove all of the food resources in our yards for coyotes, we still need to, be, we still need to watch out for the food that brings in rabbits and squirrels and other things. So if you have a bird feeder with a lot of aftermath that falls out, that might bring in squirrels and you need to make sure you clean that up because coyotes will want to come in for that. Shelter, something like refuse. If you had a refuse pile in your yard or if you had really thick, dense brush, something to either clear out or to thin out a little bit so there's not places for, for shelter for coyotes or other animals. Just a quick laundry list to go through, and all of our materials have this as well, is pet food. 
to keep that inside, along with water. To supervise your pets and children outside all the time, clean up any trash that you might have in your yard, keep your garbage container inside your garage until the day of pickup, secure your, uh, your barbecue grills, and clean them up very well as, well as well. So those are the main things, and just always keep that in mind that when you have, you're looking at the attractants in your yard, is to look at what are those resources that a coyote wants and maybe the prey species of a coyote. So let's talk about hazing. Hazing, again, is the tool we use to instill fear into coyotes that they are not to be around humans. It's very difficult to haze coyotes in an organized effort. We have some very motivated volunteers who will get together in groups of 10 to 20 and go out in an open space. But the possibility of a chance encounter with a coyote to haze them is, is really low. So it really must become a personal responsibility during chance encounters. When you're out there by yourself at 7 at night, walking your dog down the open space, and you come across a coyote that's 30 feet away from you, that can be a, a fearful experience. And a tendency to walk back slowly or to turn and run away versus actually hazing that coyote and letting him know that he's not supposed to be there. And we also must be adaptable in our techniques. If you're on the open space one day and you see a coyote and you scream and yell at it, and it takes off running, that's, kudos to you. That's what we wanted to see happen. But a week, a month, or a year later, you see a coyote walking a sidewalk in your neighborhood and you scream and yell at it and it just looks at you kind of silly and keeps walking like it was never scared. And at that time, we need to be adaptable. We need to pick up a rock or sticks or do something else that will try to scare that coyote away. And again, Kristen will cover a little bit more about hazing and some of those efforts. So human health and safety. Colorado Parks and Wildlife has two priorities. One is the protection and enhancement of wildlife populations. And the other one is the protection of human health and safety. And some folks might think that these are conflicting priorities. However, we have a responsibility to the public, both legally and ethically, to respond to aggressive animals and animals that attack human beings. And to give you an example of what happens, we really have two things that we're going after when we have a coyote that bites a human. One is the removal of that animal or animals that were involved in that attack. And two, and very importantly, is to identify why that animal did it. Was it because there was an attractant in a person's yard when that coyote was going from the open space to the yard that came across a child? Was it the fact that the animals were habituated? That might imply to us that we've lacked in our hazing efforts. So we try to identify the problem and come up with a solution so we don't see the repeat behavior again. And the most importantly with coexistence is the idea of helping your community, taking personal responsibility of the issue, informing friends and neighbors, taking part in hazing efforts, whether it be in a group or be on your own, and distributing information to the public. And then, of course, working towards a combined goal of protecting wildlife and our fellow community members. We realize from our past, and we learn those lessons, that coyotes will be here and humans will be here. So hopefully through a path of coexistence, we can get to a place where we all can live together. So that should conclude my presentation. I think Kristen's going to follow up with a smart card and some other stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks a lot. So Mary McCormick with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, you want to come up now for a moment? Um, we want to talk with everybody tonight about an opportunity about how you can help your particular neighborhood here in Broomfield. And it's called Coyote Crew. And Colorado Parks and Wildlife has uh, developed some of these crews in the Denver area, I believe, and they've been very successful. Mary McCormick is here tonight. She's our Northeast Region Education Coordinator for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And I'd like to ask Mary to talk a little bit about what Coyote Crew is. And we are going to have a January 14th training right here in Broomfield. There are sheets outside in the lobby that you can sign up on if you'd like to work in your neighborhood. And uh, we'd like to provide this uh, kind of opportunity for citizens here in Broomfield to get, get engaged with this coyote practice. Um, so with that, Mary, would you talk a little bit about what you've done in Denver sure. so people can have a better idea sure. about it? Thanks. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so our coyote crew uh, developed in 2008 really in response to some incidents we were having in the Denver metro area, particular, particularly with pets. And uh, there was a lot of, um, you know, people that were pretty upset and not really knowing what to do. And so the officers in the Denver metro area and our public outreach team got together and decided that maybe what we needed was a community-based program that's modeled after a very successful program we already have, which is called our Bear Aware program. 
And so the idea behind these volunteer groups is that they're, they're members of the community who are very passionate about reducing human wildlife conflicts in their community. And it's really taking those people that are really passionate, they don't want to see uh, wildlife being put down, but at the same time, they want to see people's pets and, and people feel safe and comfortable in their own communities. So what we did is, we, again, modeled it largely after our Bear Aware program, uh, did a recruitment effort in the Denver metro area, designed a training for the volunteers around this idea of you being not only a voice in your community, but also being kind of the right-hand man for our local officers. As Chris mentioned, he has a huge territory to cover, and there's no way he can respond to every single thing that happens. And with the volunteers, they really can help with some of those knocking on doors, um, you know, going to vet clinics and uh, pets, you know, the local mom and pop pet stores asking them, hey, would you mind having some of our materials available for your customers? So that the more information, the more education we get out there, the more, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see these, these conflicts reducing. So when we set up the training, the idea behind it was, again, people in the Denver metro area, we're, we're going to train you on the biology. A lot of the stuff you, you learned here today would be in that training as well. Also some scenario training, what, what could happen if you do knock on that door of someone who could be a little bit upset about what's going on. Um, and also being comfortable with the policies that we have at Colorado Parks and Wildlife of how we handle uh, our responses to um, wildlife incidents and attacks. So um, we had a pretty successful, when we first ran the training we had about oh, maybe like 10 to 12 people came, got them trained up. They'll also work uh, events like maybe the Furry Scurry down in Denver. Um, different events, I mean, here in Broomfield, your, you know, your local events, you could set up a booth. That's a great opportunity for a, a Coyote crew member to share information with the community about what they can do to reduce conflicts. So I won't go into too much more detail. If people are interested, please you know, visit us out at the table. But I will say you know, our, some of our main messaging is uh, wildlife conflicts in a community is a community issue. And it can only be solved by the community working together to help reduce conflicts. If you're doing everything right and your neighbor is feeding coyotes, all your efforts have gone to waste. So it really is about if you really care about this issue and you really want to see uh, conflicts reduce then join us on the coyote crew and we'll get you out there and get you all our materials and get some training and uniform and, and go out and share how we all can live and coexist with wildlife. So thank you. Thank you Mary. I also just wanted to add that um, next week we'll be having a meeting up in Anthem. We've been invited by the Anthem homeowners associations to come and talk about coyotes and also to talk about a lot of other um, community issues, questions about landscaping and things like that. But at that meeting, we hope to get some more people signed up for the coyote crew. I think we have about seven now, right now, from uh, the Anthem area. So I hope some of you will be perhaps interested in that tonight. That would be great to have you help. I wanted to talk a little bit about the coyote research that we're doing here. The first study that we'll be a part of is this Colorado State University study that's being uh, directed by Stuart Breck. And the idea is that we will probably put GPS collars on several coyotes so that we can begin to understand how those particular coyotes are moving through our community. I think it should be very interesting um, there will be other parts to the study. Um, Breck is still developing his protocol for this research, but we're really looking forward to being a part of this uh, project, and we'll be sure to share that information with the community. The next thing that we've um, decided to do is bring in some additional research experts on coyotes. And we plan to have this group come out in January uh, for two days. They'll be visiting the Anthem neighborhood. They'll be interviewing our Colorado Parks and Wildlife officers, our staff, our police staff, the citizens that experience the bites in Anthem. 
and try to learn and piece together what happened during that process and what, what might have been the cause. We all have some ideas of what the causes might be, but we thought it would be very helpful to get some additional insight into the situation. So Stan Garrett is uh, with Ohio State University, and if any of you have seen that film on Channel 8 right now about coyotes, uh, it's called American Coyote Still Wild at Heart. He's one of the main researchers in that movie and has been studying coyotes in Chicago for over 10 years. So I think he should be a, a real asset to us. Seth Riley um, is with UCLA, and he also is the uh, head wildlife ecologist with the Santa Monica National Recreation Area. So this recreation area is right in the Los Angeles area. And if any of you have been to Topanga Canyon and that part of the LA, dist, LA metro area, that's where this, this park is, if you can imagine, kind of interwoven among all those development areas. So he's had a lot of experience working with communities and particularly with citizens when there have been coyote conflicts. Uh, Julie Young is a um, professor with U Utah State and she runs a National Wildlife Research Center in Logan, Utah, where they actually have some coyotes in captivity and they're observing their reactions in controlled experiments to different, different things. And we felt that that would be another interesting angle to bring to this kind of blitz of studying our situation here in Broomfield with coyotes. And I just wanted to show you this picture of Anthem. It is a glorious, beautiful neighborhood, but you can see how in this particular park, which is at the corner of Traver and, uh, is it that Indian Peaks? Pebble Creek, I think it, uh, something like, it's one of their big parkways through their neighborhood. This is in Anthem Highlands. And you can see how lush that environment is with water, many of the things that Wendy and Chris were talking about that can attract coyotes. Water, lush habitat, uh, other animals living in that area. So I think this is going to be really helpful research to us. They will be actually um, preparing a written paper of their thoughts on the issue and we'll be sharing that also. The next uh, piece of research here, and this is not scientific or statistically accurate in any way, this is a citizen coyote survey that Mary Ann Bonnell at Aurora, uh, she's their uh, senior naturalist there, has developed, and she passes this out at all sorts of community events. So we passed this out at Broomfield Days. We got 95 respondents. And the, the quick little survey ask people, how willing are you to do these various things, to keep your dog on a leash, keep your cat indoors, supervise my pets, ask a neighbor to stop feeding, haze coyotes when I see them, secure trash, and so on. And so these are the results. And strongly unwilling is over on, on uh, I guess that would be your left, and strongly willing on the right. Um, what we see is that in the light blue boxes there, People are not so happy about having to keep domestic cats indoors. They're a little concerned about telling a neighbor not to feed wildlife, uh, particularly coyotes and so on. And they're a little uncertain about what we mean by hazing, it appears, and, and how comfortable they really are to do something like that. So these are areas where we need to work on. We want to bring all these numbers up to 100% <laughs> in a perfect world. <laughs> So we have this survey out in the lobby, and if you have time, we'd like you to fill it out. All you do is just tick the box that matches what you're willing to do. And please be honest with us. If you really are willing to do everything, great. If you aren't, we'd like to know that so we can work on some of our education in that area. Now I'd like to ask my two assistants to come up to the stage. and. Uh, these two gentlemen, Andrew and Jacob Holler, are students at Monarch High School, and they called me last week and asked me if they could be involved with this presentation. And I was kind of amazed that they were interested in helping us out. But they said they would. So what I thought I would ask them to do is demonstrate how you can haze. And using Colorado Parks and Wildlife acronym here, Be Smart. Smart stands for stop, make yourself look big, announce, retreat, and tell an adult. And if you're an adult 
and you had a very scary situation, call our department, Broomfield Open Space and Trails, Animal Control, or Colorado Parks and Wildlife. We do want to hear about that. Now, if you just see a coyote passing in the open space out in the distance, we don't need to know about that. But we're talking about situations that are extremely uncomfortable. So with that, I will go over here, and we're going to practice this hazing. And I welcome everybody to stand up and join in this. Don't worry, you're going to have to come up on the stage. But I'd like you to just get the feel for it. Come on, come on. I know you're going to shy. Come on, get the front row here. Go to our parks and wildlife right here. Come on up. I'm all in the machine. I will not stop until you're all standing. OK. So Andrew and Jacob are walking home. Stop! Make yourself look big. Announce! Be alone! Retreat! And tell an adult. Let's do it one more time. If you want to join in with him, I would really appreciate it. Okay? Come on, guys. Repeat. Hey Pete, I just saw a kind of like And Andrew and Jake will be helping with those surveys out in the lobby. And so, you know, I think as, as maybe odd as that seemed to ask you to stand up this evening, it's something you just want to almost have happen as second nature with you. So you don't see a coyote and go, oh, you know, and I've talked to many friends and they said, yeah, you know, I saw a coyote. And I say, well, did you haze? And they said, well, I'm really not sure what you're talking about, Kristen. And what do you mean by that? And so I think having an idea of what you do and being prepared for that is really good. Jacob and Andrew had small little cans with rocks in them, too, that we just handmade at home. And you can shake those. You can keep those in your... your um, uh, fanny pack if you carry one of those or just in your hand. We also have whistles um, that are out at most of the tables there that you are welcome to take. So it's, it's something that is a benefit to you personally to protect you. It's also a benefit for our coyotes in our community. We don't want them to become habituated and to have terrible conflicts with human beings. That's the last thing we want to have happen in our community. So I really encourage you to um, take these small cards where we have this written on them, just a little version that you can put on the fridge or keep it in your, your pack, and to also grab one of those whistles and take a few if you've got some friends or neighbors that you think might be interested in using them. I want to thank you for coming tonight. Um, if you are interested in the Coyote Crew, please sign up. We have information tables from Wild Earth Guardians, our local nature program, our wildlife masters, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife out, outside for you to enjoy. Um, somebody's already ready to use that whistle. And if you need more information or you need to contact Pete or me, just go to the Broomfield website, www.broomfield.org, and go to the open space page, and we will information on coyotes and how you contact is all, all on that site.